you everybody uh, for attending our first larger uh, event sponsored by Cassie, the Corporation Society Initiative. Um, we already, this is following the academic adjustment period of the first year students. Congratulations, the midterms are over. Um, we already actually had one visitor, but we were not allowed to market it to MBAs, uh, and she was here uh, mostly visiting the faculty and the PhD students, Francine McKenna, who, uh, who writes about auditing. And so it's a little bit related to some of the topics that uh, our guest uh, has written about, accounting and auditing. And we actually recorded a, a, a little interview with her uh, under what, what might become more of a series called uh, Power to Truth. So the idea is that um, we part of what we're doing here is, you know, sunshine-based disinfectant, you know, accountability, governance, power to truth. And so that's very much befitting uh, the current, uh, the event today. Uh, my name is Anat Admati, I didn't say. I'm a finance professor here, but uh, with much broader uh, interest than that. And I founded and I'm the faculty director of uh, CASI. Um, we are also led by Lisa Timson right there, our uh, staff director, and helped a lot to exist and function by Loretta Gallagos. Uh, and importantly, by a group of uh, student leaders um, who are here. Ryan is taking the online um, questions. And Tom Newcamp, uh, one of our great leaders, uh, who, fun fact, was uh, in the Marine for 12 and a half years, a pilot, uh, and now a JD MBA student. And he'll do a more of a systemic introduction to our visitor, Bethany McLean, who all the MBAs know because even some for some of you yesterday, she speaks, uh, has become a speaker regularly since visiting way pre Cassie uh, here uh, in the accounting courses. And the topic, of course, in accounting is indeed uh, truth and disclosure. Uh, and uh, auditing industry, what she wrote about, uh, what she made her famous is the big accounting scandal of Enron, which also led to the demise of auditing company, um, Arthur Anderson. Anyway, I'll take, uh, I'll let uh, Tom take it from here. Thank you very much for coming. Bethany, I'd like to uh, echo Anat's thanks for joining us today. We are so lucky to have you here. Also, thank you to Loretta, Lisa, and Anat. These programs wouldn't happen without you. And also, Ryan, who's running our online portion. We've got several people that are tuning in virtually, and I think maybe we'll get some questions for them later. I was lucky enough to the, attend the first Cassie event uh, last year, where you interviewed Tarek Fancy. And you started off by giving everyone your goals for, for what that interview was. And so I'd like to sort of echo that. But what we're talking about today is uh, Bethany's new book, The Big Fail, which is a comprehensive look at the American response uh, to, to SARS-CoV-2 or, or COVID-19. And since 2019, the United States has had about 1.3 million excess deaths, so the number of deaths over what we might have expected during that time frame, which is, uh, for as far as deaths per million, the leading, essentially, the, the modern world. And so I think for me personally, what I'd like to do is I'd only like to ask you three questions because I came to listen to you, not me. My personal goal is that those three questions are a springboard for everyone else's questions that we can get to. And then our goal today is to sort of help you tell us how the United States could have the schizophrenic response of leading the, the free world in the number of deaths per million, but also in the, the vaccine creation, or maybe perhaps better said, vaccine distribution. So thank you all for coming, and thanks to everybody at Cassie for, for having me here. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, so I, I worked on this book with a guy named Joe Nocera, who is my longtime editor at Fortune, um, and with whom I've collaborated on several other projects. He edited The Smartest Guys in the Room, and we co-authored a book about the financial crisis. And our goal is always to look behind the headlines. And instead of writing a TikTok of what happens when things go wrong, it's to say, how did, how did we get to the point where, thing, where, this, where this would go wrong? What were the preconditions that allowed this to be such a disaster? So our story of the financial crisis 
crisis is a story of everything that was put in place that enabled the financial crisis to, to happen. And that's, and that's what we tried to do, to do here. And you're right, the numbers, the numbers are staggering. The excess death rate in the US is, is, is really, really high. And I think part of that is, is a story of an of a incompetent and fragmented um, response by, by the president at the time. But I think it is magical thinking to believe that that was the entire problem. You know, we want to we wanna look at that and say, oh, if we had just had a more competent president, then this outcome would have been so much better. This is all the fault of, 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 of then President Trump. Um, and that's, it's not true because the number of deaths actually in the first year of the Biden administration were higher than the number of deaths in, in, in the Trump administration. And while the two periods aren't directly comparable. It also tells you that it's just not as, as, as simple as a, as a bad president in a fragmented response. And so I think one of the big issues um, that our country faces is our, our really two-tiered healthcare system, which has resulted in dramatic, dramatically different um, health, health outcomes um, based, based on where you live in the United States and what, what, what your income level is. And a guy who's written about this really compellingly for anybody who's interested is a doctor at Rush Hospital in Chicago named David Ansell, who wrote a book called The Death Gap, which pointed out that death rates basically for, that, that, that white wealthy Chicagoans were living about 25 years longer um, than poor um, African American Chicagoans. And he tried to explore the, 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 the reasons why. <laughs> There's this, a little bit of a tangent, there was this chilling statistic in his book that in, out of all the years he worked in safety net hospitals, all of his, his patients were the organ donors for the wealthy people who needed them, and never once did an organ come the other, the other, the other, the other direction. And that's sort of in some ways like a, meta, a, a comment on how we, how we got to COVID. We just have COVID preyed on, on people with pre-existing illnesses, and we have a healthcare system that doesn't keep people healthy. It, uh, so you could see by the fact that hospitals um, basically had to be bailed out in the pandemic because they were going to go bankrupt otherwise, which is crazy when you think about it, right? The very time that hospitals are the most needed and are the busiest, they're going bankrupt. And that's because they're not paid to keep people healthy. They're paid for, they're paid for elective surgeries. And so I think the pandemic just laid bare how screwed up our healthcare system is um, and how it leaves people um, um, without, without access to healthcare. And then one of the things that struck me the most um, in the early stages of the pandemic was that all the scenes, the terrible scenes from overcrowded hospitals, were all from poor hospitals. You, you weren't you weren't seeing this or hearing this from the from wealthy hospitals in, in wealthy parts of the country. And I thought, wait, what 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 is this? What's what what's happening here? And so I think that's one part of the story we tell. Um, another part of the story we tell is how. Basically, the quest for profits in, in this in this sort of monomaniacal quest for profits, we forgot about resilience, and there is some kind of trade-off there that if you are pushing and pushing and pushing to make everything as profitable as possible, you're also making it more and more fragile, and we saw that when supply chains broke um, in, in in COVID. First, obviously, starting with PPE, and it turned out in this rush to offshore everything, all of a sudden, when you need something, uh oh! But that extended. Through the, through the course of the pandemic, even to semiconductor chips. And we've had this realization of sorts that we have let go of a lot of, um, a lot of capacity here. So I, I think the, 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 the framework of the book in the end is the failure of government to set the right rules for, for business and, and therefore for, for society. Um, but, but the vaccine story is, is, runs counter to that because I think Operation Warp Speed is a tremendous triumph and it shows how business and government can work together. And it doesn't mean that there aren't flaws with it and things you can criticize, by, by the way, and we can come back to those if anybody's interested. But the fact that there were people in the government, um, namely Alex Azar, the then head of um, Secretary of Health and Human Services, who were able to look at this and say, the vaccine companies on their own are never gonna make a vaccine. That's just not the way the market, is, the market incentives work today. Vaccines aren't rewarded by shareholders. There have been too many cases where companies have, have, have made vaccines in response to a pandemic only to see the demand for their products go away and they get penalized by shareholders. So if we're going to make this work, we need government incentives. And because no va vaccine manufacturing, very little was done in the United States anymore, we also need government to get involved to mobilize industrially and to make this happen so that not only do we have the vaccines that work, but that we're able to manufacture them. And so I think Operation Warp Speed is kind of a great 
great example of, of a, a private-public partnership, which we all talk about, but, but rarely exists. And I think it lays bare this deeper truth that, that uh, Anat, Professor Admati, talks a lot about, about Cassie, that, that you have to set the right ground rules. There isn't really any such thing as a, as a free market. It's all, it's all, everything is in how the ground rules are set. And so I think sometimes when you look at ground rules that were set decently well, it, it can provide a path forward maybe. I think that's such a, a wonderful set of those sort of preconditions that you talked about, globalization, this belief in free market and, and all things, uh, and, and private equity, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get to talking to. For, for my first question, now we're moving from the preconditions to the, the decisions during the pandemic that may have exacerbated the problem or ameliorated it in the case of Operation Warp Speed. Uh, in 2020, we had the CARES Act, so $2.2 trillion worth of aid, about $175 billion to, to our hospitals. Uh, but it was allocated in a way that Zach Cooper described as, and I quote, literally the dumbest way you could have designed it. I'm, I'm curious, and, and that way was essentially based on revenues. On its face, that, that might serve to actually make sense. The hospital with the highest revenue most likely has the highest patients. How did we get there? Why was that the dumbest way you could have designed it? So it, it, it doesn't make sense because the hospitals with the highest revenues did not have the highest number of COVID patients. So what it turned into was a handout to the wealthiest hospitals who didn't necessarily need the money, while those hospitals that were serving most of the patients who were severely affected by COVID and who were overrun by patients um, didn't have the revenues and got less of the money. So that's why he called it the dumbest way you could you could you could ever have 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 have, have done it. And you know I'm a little bit sympathetic to some of the mistakes that policymakers made in, in trying to get money out the door really, really, really quickly. But I do think the hospital example points to this deeper kind of fallacy or this deeper um, uh, um, issue at the heart of our at the heart of our healthcare system is that we have this system set up where that is that is supposedly a free market at work and where hospital survival is dependent on their ability to make money yet the entire abil ability to make money is societally constructed by the level of government by the level of government um, the level of government reimbursement and so the the whole the whole the whole system on its on its by its very setup is 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 screwed up. In other words, you've sort of dictated that the wealthiest hospitals with commercial with commercially insured patients are going to do well and the poorest hospitals serving Medicaid or the uninsured are not going to do well. And then when people politicians come along and say we have too many hospital beds, we need to close the hospitals. These hospitals aren't performing well, therefore they're going to get closed. You end up leaving places with with hospital deserts. But why is it because those hospitals weren't providing a necessary service? Is it because those hospitals were providing worse care at a higher price? Well, not necessarily. The hospitals that do the best in our system aren't those that provide the best care at the lowest price. In fact, one of my favorite um, anecdotes in, in the book, and this reveals what a wonky brain I have, but um, I found this study from Johns Hopkins looking at the most expensive hospitals in the US based on um, the amount of their markup over Medicare prices. And I went through the list and found that it was either seven or eight of the top Top 10 belong to H HCA, Hospital Corporation of America, which is the wealthiest, um, uh, most profitable um, hospital chain in, in the country. And so they succeed because they're able to mark up their, their prices so much more than other people because they 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 play games with insurers and use you basically have use, use a monopoly and local monopolies in order to um, get really high rates from insurance companies. But but that's how it works. And that that just it's it's sort of a mockery of a facsimile of capitalism at its at its best. It's kind of capitalism at its worst, where the game is rigged from the get go. We're all appreciative of your wonky brain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And another wonky decision for my last question, and then I'll, then I'll open it up, might be on the other side, the Operation Warp Speed, the win. So at the same time that the CARES Act is going out where they didn't have the right people in the room, uh, Monsef Slaoui is sitting by his pool and he, he gets a phone call from a Republican congressman. And that's essentially the, the sort of start of Operation Warp Speed, uh, which is a phenomenal story about distribution, about getting the right folks uh, in the room with the right motivations. And I'm, my question is, what lessons can we learn about how that leadership was constructed um, and, and kept alive through the, through the pandemic that we could sort of glean? So, yeah, I, I, 
one of the things I love about Operation Warp Speed is one of the, the, the book begins with this controversy over masking and not because we have a definitive answer as to whether masks are the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world, but rather because the debate over masks shows how polarized we are as a, as a society and how unwilling to listen to other people we are to reach across the aisle. The aisle. And I wrote, you know, we prefer to hunker down in walls of unassailable virtue built, 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 by, our, built by our ideological uh, predispositions. And what, one of the things I love about Warp Speed is that it, it wasn't that. So people sometimes, it hasn't even been written about that much, the inner workings of it, because people in the press perceived it as a Trump administration thing without looking under the surface and realizing that most of the people who ran this were anything but Trump fans. This guy, Monsef Slawi, an immigrant who, uh, was, who, who developed more vaccines than any, anybody else, was a socialist when he was growing up and a hardcore Democrat. But when asked to do this for his country, he, he, he did it and he gave up a fortune. He owned a lot of shares in Moderna, which he, he he knew was gonna was gonna be successful in making an mRNA vaccine, and he gave them up before joining before joining Warp Speed, and he did the right thing for his country. Instead of saying, "Oh no no no, this is being run by the Trump administration. I'm not doing this," he 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 did it because it was the right thing to do, and the. Um, the, the people who ran Warp Speed um, um, likened it to the Manhattan Project, uh, and you had uh, you had you had the Oppenheimer, and then I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. The the other guy who did the who did all the logistics, and so the other side of that was was General Gustav Perna, who was a, a, an army guy, who and the army ran all the logistics of this, and so it was also this cooperation. Even as Warp Speed writ large was a cooperation between the government and the private sector, writ smaller it was a cooperation between the army and um, and people who had come from the private sector. And one of the surprising things to everybody involved was how great a work experience it was um, and how much they had to learn to learn from each other. But overall, it was people trying to do the, the, the right thing for, for, for the country, not people trying to not people staking out a political a political stance, and I think so often today we we stake out our political ground, um, our ideological ground, instead of thinking first what's 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 the right thing to do, what what actually makes sense here, um, and so that I, I love that story for for that reason, and you know oddly enough the um, as as much as the people who ran this weren't fans of the Trump administration, um, Monsef Slawi and a couple of others ended up coming away saying um, the reason this worked was, was Jared Kushner. He protected it from politics getting, getting involved. And so they were also able to see um, some good in somebody who they might have been predisposed um, not to see any good in. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I might push you to give us a little more context on that too. One of the quotes that I, I can remember vividly from the book is, is when you describe this as perhaps a problem or a program that might only work in a, tr a presidency like the Trump administration. So uh, one of the people involved in Warp Speed said this to me, that, that, that Trump would have been the only president who would have been hands off enough to let it, to let it run <laughs> with, 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 without him. So that maybe it didn't happen despite, of Trump, and despite Trump, maybe it happened because of him in some, in some odd kind of way, because he was willing to just Delegate and let and let and, and let it run as it was and as it was going to run and it did run without political interference for the, for the most part. I mean, Trump tried at the end when he started to try to when he uh, verbally put pressure on people to get a vaccine out before the before the election and people pushed back and it didn't didn't happen. <laughs> so really incredible lessons on leadership, organizations, uh, and sort of putting ego aside and, and working together. You may know this from your time in the, in, in the Army, but I loved some of the examples in the book of how um, the private sector and the Army worked together because of how the Army people ran conference calls or ran Zooms. They had all these ways of dealing with multiple people on, on the line that when you were done speaking, you'd say, over. So nobody started interrupting you before, before you were done. And they had all these ways of making sure that if, if a task were, was, was given, they had a, they had a catchphrase that you would say so that asked and accepted so that you knew that the task had been assigned and somebody was accountable for it. I thought all of that was just fantastic. <laughs> I, I read that and I literally laughed out loud because I said, this might be the only time the American military gets props for being efficient. I was like, this is, this is great. So thanks for making us look good. Uh, as you can imagine, I will continue to ask Bethany questions with alacrity if no one has them. But does anyone, thank you, does anyone have any questions? Um, thanks, Bethany. Um, my question is, uh, what role do you think executive compensation had on exacerbating the crisis? And if, if you think it played a role, what your thoughts are on reforms? 
So I don't know that executive compensation exacerbated this particular crisis, but I do, I do think, in 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 the end, the the crisis um, showcased income inequality in terms of who got protected and who and and who got left behind, and I think that that executive compensation is a huge um, part of of not a huge part, but it is it is a part of of income inequality, and one of the the stunning things to me in this was the, the number of companies who during the pandemic said, you know, our frontline workers, our essential workers who are out here doing this and keeping stores open and putting themselves at risk, and how poorly those people ended up doing relative to shareholders. Brookings had an interesting study on this. And basically, shareholders of these companies made tons of money in the form of dividends. And while while the frontline workers got a fraction of the, of, of the profits that 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 were made, and it's a little bit of a tangent from what what you said, but I was also really stunned to learn, but from this GAO report, that some of the biggest some of the people who are the biggest recipients of um, government aid government government aid programs are um, actually employed by some of our biggest companies, but they can't earn a living wage even full time employment. But they can't earn a living wage working full time for some of our biggest companies, so they have to get government benefits instead, which just begs this. Again, Again, question about how our society is structured. Wouldn't you rather have people make enough money so that they can have the dignity of work and make enough money, rather make enough money to survive, rather than having people who are working a full-time job have to basically have the money go in a full circle and have it paid out to them in the form of benefits from from taxation? So, it, 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 I think there's there. I think your question gets at some fundamental issues that the pandemic helped um, highlight. Um, thank you so much, Bethany. Um, given the importance of the rules of the game, how do you think that we can better protect the political system from influence from corporations in order to influence the rules of the game? Yeah, that's such a good question, um, and it's the key question, and or one of the key questions. And I, I don't know that we can. I mean, it, it, it is, it is stunning how much, um, the, how much the preconditions are set by, by, by corporate lobbying, and then people also look at the outcomes and say, well, this is the outcome without stepping back to look at how the rules of the game have, were, 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 were rigged in the first place. And I, I don't know under our current political system if there is a way. If there, if there's, if there's a way, if there's a way to fix that, I mean, there's so much talk about getting money out of politics, and no one ever seems to be able to actually, to actually make, make, make that happen. So, I used to think, <laughs> I used to think that that every crisis would have a silver lining, and that it would showcase a problem, and then obviously, because the price, the crisis had showed the problem, we would fix it, right? So, um, when Enron went bankrupt, everybody started talking about. How how short-term American business was and how there was this focus on quarterly earnings and that we needed to think more for the long term and then business would be so much healthier and I was like, oh my God, something good comes out of this. And you know, 20 plus years later, we're still talking about American business being too short-term and if anything, it's gotten even more short-term. And after the financial crisis, I thought, oh, there's a silver lining. We're gonna look at how we finance mortgages in the US and we're look at, gonna look at how banks are capitalized and we're gonna really think through these issues and figure out how to have a more stable banking system, one that works for everybody, and how to make sure that mortgages are financed in a way that, that, that makes sense so that this most American of things, home ownership, can be, can, can be stable. And <laughs> over a decade after the financial crisis, we have done very, very little of that. And so I'd like to believe that out of, out of this crisis, there are going to be lessons learned and people are going to take action, but I'm, I'm not sure that's true. And that's, I realize, very cynical. So I'm trying to find something, I'm trying to find something more optimistic to say. <laughs> Maybe I'll think of it as we talk. <laughs> I like to be optimistic. <laughs> there are some differences between uh, now and 2008. Um, perhaps the biggest difference being how we receive information. And we talked, uh, Bethany was gracious enough to have a small group dinner with us on Wednesday, where we talked about how information receipt might change the sort of nature of the relationship and trust. Do you think maybe there's an avenue there to, to, to reach this result? 
you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there is. So this guy, if anybody's interested in some reading that I found pretty profound, this guy Martin Gurry, um, who was a CIA information analyst, wrote a book that came out maybe 2016. And I think it's his only book, so the fact that I can't remember the title um, shouldn't be a problem. But one of his points was just, a world, in a world of wash in information, you have to govern differently than you did in a world that wasn't a wash in information, because you can't afford to tell people lies or half-truths, because they're going to know. Um, they're, they're, they're going to know that, that, that you're lying. And so I guess in direct answer to your question, if we can cut through um, all of the, the, the misinformation and if all of the information out there can be, can be, can be valid and, 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 and focused, then, then, then maybe, that, maybe that can do something. Maybe a more educated and informed populace will, 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 will make things better. But I worry we're just, we've talked about Alice in Wonderland, I worry we're just going down the rabbit hole of information overload and that it's not resulting in a smarter, more informed society, that instead it's just resulting in deluge and people shutting down and no longer listening or caring. Well, I'll just send 600 of these books to Washington and maybe we'll, we'll make a little bit of progress. <laughs> there you go, hi, Matt. So I will, uh, you have a, the chapter where you discuss the hospitals, it's called The Folly of Efficiency. And in it, you also discuss private equity, which is kind of a big deal in, uh, in, in the circles in business schools. Um, and you know, we had one of them tell us how they're going to solve inequality and all last year. Um, but there were also, at the very time he was here, there, was, uh, there were two books that came out almost simultaneously and independently, uh, one written by Josh Rosner and, and Gretchen Morganson, the other one written by, I don't remember his name, but a, a, a DOJ, ex-DOJ uh, guy. And both of them have had the word plunder in the title. And so I just wonder if you can talk more generally about private equity, because you also wrote an excerpt of the book, uh, specific to hospitals, but they are in many, many industries nowadays. Yeah, so I have nothing against, um, um, and I, I said in our small group dinner, I'm, I actually am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism um, in sort of the way, the, a version of Winston Churchill's famous quote about democracy. It might be the worst possible system out there with a possible exception of ev everything else that's been tried. And so I have nothing against capitalism functioning when it functions, when it hasn't been corrupted. And, and I just think that a lot, of, a lot of what happens today has been corrupted by, by various things. So to go back to your question um, on, on private equity, the original business uh, as it was created in the 19th 1980s was it, it had a, a core, a kind of appealing idea, which makes sense in a way. Take a company out of, away from the pressures of the public market and improve the business, and then and make it better, and then sell it back to the public markets and and make money using a lot of debt. Yes, but you know, at its core was this idea that you could do something away. You, if you freed a company from the demands of the public market and let it be private, you could do things to fix it. And you can quibble with how it worked even back then. Uh, you know the Gordon Gecko movie, Greed is Good, and you know layoffs and all, all, and and you could quibble, but at least there was at the core of it a sort of reasonable business proposition. Um, I think in the ensuing decades, uh, with the kind of perversion of basically free money due to the Fed's ultra low interest rate policies, uh, the business the business completely changed, and it became one of financial engineering, where you didn't actually have to improve the underlying business. You didn't even have to have the underlying business still be viable, as long as you could put enough debt on it during the time when you owned it to be able to make your money back, it, 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 it didn't really matter. And so I think we've gone with private equity, at least as, as practiced in its most visible form, from something that, 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 that at least wasn't a capital isn't, to, to use the name of my podcast, to something that is very, very much a capital, a capital isn't. And I would love to see an academic or, or a student, somebody in this room, do, do a study because there's a lot of debate over private equity returns and whether they've kept up with the market or whether they haven't, especially when accounting for leverage. And oh my god, you can find a study saying anything you, you want the study to say. But what I haven't seen anybody do is pull out dividend recapitalizations where after the private equity firm has 
bought the company, they use declining interest rates to layer a bunch more debt onto the company um, and then have the company pay that out in a dividend to, to its investors. And I'd love to see how much dividend recapitalizations have contributed to private equity returns because that's just pure financial engineering, right? That's not any kind of improvement in the underlying business. And in an era of higher interest rates, that's also possi quite possibly gone. And so I'd, 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 I'd love to know what those, what those numbers what those numbers look like. Anyway, I was stunned, and thanks to the great work of two professors, um, Eileen Applebaum and Rosemary Batt, to learn that in 2011, seven of the biggest hospital chains in the country were owned by private equity firms, and they're gone now. They're almost private equity is almost entirely gone from the hospital industry. But they didn't leave behind a uh, improved industry that was functioning more efficiently, that had gotten it together in any way. They left behind a debt-ridden mess, um, in, in essence. And yet they managed to make their money anyway. And they made their money in large part through dividend recaps and then through take, buying a hospital chain and selling the underlying real estate to this very um, sketchy um, REIT um, called Medical Properties Trust that is run out of Alabama and that now I think is the biggest owner of hospitals, hospital real estate in the country. Um, it's either the biggest or the second biggest. And nobody, you'd say Medical Properties Trust to most people in the medical business or the hospital industry, and they'd be like, what? What, what, what are you talking about? And there is clearly, I'm going to say this at some risk because I haven't, I, I want to write about, I want to dig into this even more than I did in the book. There's clearly some collusion going on between the private equity firms and medical properties trust and some, something happening that is, that, is, that is not good because the biggest private equity firms who have owned hospitals have done repeated deals with medical properties trusts, selling hospital, selling hospital real estate, that it's very clear that the hospitals are going to go bankrupt and they're not eventually going to be able to pay. So there's something MPT or, or its ownership is getting out of this that I still don't um, that I still don't entirely understand, but that I think it tells a really discouraging story of of, of private of, of private equity, and I don't. Again, coming back to this larger theme that it's government setting the right rules that is the important thing. I I was thinking, oh, bad, evil, private equity, how awful, how awful they are. So somebody I was talking to said, basically, private equity is just doing what we allowed them to do. Of course they're going to do that. Their fiduciary duty is to their investors. If you allow a private equity firm to buy a hospital, then they almost have to do a dividend recap, or they almost have to take advantage of this financing um, opportunity and sell the real estate to MPT because they have to make money for their investors. That's that's the way it works. And so, again, it's, it's the failure of our government to set the right rules for, 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 for private equity firms. And there is, a, there is a sneaky thing about it. People have tried, like in um, Massachusetts, they tried to say when Cerberus, a private equity firm, came in and bought this chain of hospitals, they tried to say, you can't do a dividend recap for five years. So instead, Cerberus sold the real estate to MPT because the Silly uh, state regulators hadn't yet realized that that was a thing you could do. So, you know, business does have a way of finding a, a sneaky avenue, no matter what regulators try to do. But I think it does it does beg this larger question of 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 do you, do you want somebody who, by law, has as their only goal making money for investors to be involved in healthcare as 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 a bigger question? Shouldn't some other values be at play? And I think I think it's a I think it's an important question for our society because I think we've allowed this ethos of the market to creep into basically every area of life under this kind of peculiar peculiarly American belief that the market is the best is 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 the best determinant of of, of outcomes. And maybe if the rules are set properly in some spheres of life, yes. But if the rules aren't set properly, no. And even if the rules are set properly in, in all spheres of life, should the market be the determinant? Um, and I, 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 I think I've come to the answer I, I think you could have an argument about this, but I think I've come to the answer that 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 no, because I think healthcare is is part of our critical infrastructure. We realized when the United States got hit by a pan pandemic that hospitals aren't a business; they're they're our infrastructure, every bit as much as our as our as our highways and you know as, as other as other parts of our, our our infrastructure are. And then you have to think about things like that differently, and 
Another quote in the book I love is from Lyndon Johnson when he enacted Medicare and Medicaid. And he said, I'm going to mangle it a little bit, but he said basically the health of our country is the most important thing because if our people aren't healthy, everything we would hope to accomplish as a society is, is, is doomed. It depends on having a, 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 health, a healthy people. And I've, I've thought back on that quote over and over again and thought, how did we, how did we get so far from that? Because it's true in the end, if our, if our population doesn't have its health, we're we're, we're, we're done for, and not just because the co rising cost of health care in this country is threatening to swamp us, but also because if we're if we're sick, we're not we're not going to do anything. It's just it's just fundamental, right? I think about the Lyndon B. Johnson's like as health as our uh, foundational aspiration quite a lot, and to me that seems an obvious place where the government can say, look, this is part of our infrastructure. Yeah, you mentioned Cerberus, sort of using one of its heads to, to go around the system. Uh, there's also perhaps uh, private credit, which is not being talked about, but definitely should be by the government. Where do you see the relationship between uh, government and private industry as far as keeping government aware of what's going on, information sharing? So I think government has a responsibility to be to be very very aware and very clear about what rules are being set and 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 how, and we just we just don't seem to do that very well. I mean, Anat and I, Professor Admati and I have had a lot of discussions about banking the banking system and the non bank system. And since you mentioned private credit, um, um, I will go there. But we've we've <laughs> we've we've set up this regulatory structure in the wake of Dodd Frank Dodd Frank, where the banks are regulated and. And, and whether correctly or not, <laughs> um, but 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 the non banks supposedly exist outside of the safety net and are are not are not regulated, and yet non bank players like hedge funds and private equity firms are now some of the biggest financial players in our in 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 in, in, in our country, and the notion that this is private equity and private credit, well, no, because the big private equity firms, their investors are the big pension funds, the big pension funds are people, teachers, firefighters, you and me, people across the country. Why is that private? Why is that any different than, 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 than the so-called public market? Why shouldn't the disclosure requirements be the same? What, what makes it private? It's not private. Um, and the private equity firms have no, did I, did I just manage to come back to the same topic? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> Um, the, 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 pri the private equity firms use that. So when, when the PPP loans got handed out, um, 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 when the pandemic first hit, they went to Washington and said, "Look at all our investors. They're teachers and firefighters. You have to give you have to give um, these PPP loans to our portfolio companies, even though we have plenty of money. But look at who depends on us for the outcome of our investment returns. Um, look at how many people we employ. So again, why why is it private? If it's that big, shouldn't it be it, shouldn't it be inside the same, the same regulatory moat as supposedly as supposedly public companies. Um, so that's one of my, and then every time we we do we do a bailout, including in the pandemic, the Fed gets huge plaudits mostly for its role in the bailout. And Joe and I took a more skeptical look at that because most of the bailout in March 2020 was because of things that are supposed to be outside of the, of the Fed's purview, not because of the regulated banking system. It was because of the non-bank sector, once again. So in the wake of the financial crisis, we all complained about shadow banking and the non-banks and how that had led to the financial crisis. And would you guess that shadow banking, how much bigger did it get? Like seven times bigger in the time between the financial crisis and the pandemic? Um, that number's not right, but it got a lot bigger. Um, and so then comes the pandemic, and most of what we had, most of what the Fed had to bail out was, once again, the things that are supposed to be outside of its, outside of its, its safety net. And then you guys saw with Silicon Valley Bank uh, the collapse in the spring that those depositors weren't supposed to be bailed out but once again the Fed had to step in and bail out what it wasn't supposed what it wasn't supposed to bail out and so that sets that that raises to me two two questions um, why 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 is that happening and is that really the way we we want this to happen that even things that are outside the safety net that aren't paying to be part of the safety net um, um, are, are are getting are getting a bailout but then but but then secondly, what happens if the Fed can't do it? If the next big one comes along and the Fed and the Fed no longer has no longer has the firepower, or the credibility, because each time the bailouts get so much bigger, and I think that's we don't we don't want the Fed to be in that position, right? We we want the Fed to be the lender of last resort, not to be not able to be the lender of last resort. 
Bethany's book has excellent chapter on quantitative easing and maybe some implications on uh, the Fed taking over and the legislator taking a powder. I promise not to ask any more questions in the front, and then we'll go to the back. You know, when you talk about uh, ground rules and government regulation and being enlightened, and I think all of us embrace that, but one of the things that occurs to me is that government, in the end, is people. And people are the people who, who, who are the operatives in enlightened regulation. And in my years in observing and in teaching at the Stanford Business School, I've noticed increasingly that the best and the brightest don't go into government as careers. And I see very little in the, in, the, uh, in the reporting community and so forth that is, is trying to address the reason why the best and the brightest people don't go into public careers. I remember at the Stanford Business School many years ago when we started the public management program, R.J. Miller started that, and his, his notion at that time was to try and make this school more relevant to government as an administrative process. And in the beginning, it was talking about people going into government, both state and local and federal. Over time, the public management program has morphed into a not-for-profit program. And, the, and, and, and that's not government. That's, that's not-for-profit. It's a form of the private sector. So I'm, I'm just wondering, have you, have you addressed in your own mind why it is that the best and the brightest in America, I don't think it's quite as true in Japan or, or, or parts of Asia and Europe, but in America, the very best and the brightest very seldom say, I'd like to have a career in the Department of Agriculture. I'd like to have a career in government mental health. Yeah. So, so I haven't in this book, but in the podcast I do with Luigi Zangales at the University of Chicago, we've, we've, we've actually talked about that. And so I'll give you my attempt at an answer, and you all may have your own answers, and you may disagree with this, or you may, or you may, or you may want, to, want, to, want to build upon it at, 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 at best. But the way I've tended to think about it is that it is an outgrowth and a very foreseeable outgrowth of income inequality, because if you can choose a career in government and be really really well respected and still make enough money to live in a nice community and send your children to a good school, then you might choose that even if you're not making quite as much as you would in the private sector. If you're making in the private sector 30, 40, 100, 200, 1,000 times the amount, then and, and it means and choosing that career in government means that you're not going to be able to send your kids to the good private school and you're not going to be able to live in the community that you want to. Suddenly that's a whole different set of set of choices and one that one that a lot of people won't won't make and for very obvious and, and understandable reasons. So I think it's 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 partly that. I also think it's the growth of a global elite that has a, its own interests separate from the interests of a community. So if you're part of this global elite, you care about competing with other members of the global elite and having your private plane, and you're not part of a community in the same way. And so you don't get the re th that position in, in local government it doesn't get you the respect that it would among the people you perceive as your peers that it, that it used to. So it's also the loss of a certain kind of prestige that used to accompany public service, where the prestige might matter more than the income or might make up for the lost income because you matter in your community, and you you had you had this prestige with, with within the world, and if you don't have that anymore, um, and you, the people you're competing with don't care about it, um, then then again, there's not there's not a reason to choose that. So it's it's that it's that confluence of factors that would be at least part of my answer for it. Uh, hi, thank you so much. You're so cool. Everyone has been like, oh my god, that accounting lecture was the best thing. <laughs> um, so one thing, I was a teacher for the last five years, and so I, I think one thing that stood out to me in your chat yesterday was talking about COVID school reopenings and the failings there. And I just wonder how you square that with the Lyndon Johnson quote of, of safety for all. And I think like, the, the acute fear of teachers in that beginning of the pandemic when you don't know what's happening and you're 
going to go back into a school of 900 kids who uh, can wear masks however they uh, choose to because they're uh, seven. Um, and I just, I wonder how you square the, the anxieties and the public health concerns and then also obviously the learning concerns and how you make that ethical choice and where you came to that choice. So I think it's really hard and was really hard, particularly when the pandemic first hit. And I have absolutely no complaint with people to, with widespread school closures when the pandemic first hit, because if this had been like influenza, then the schools would have been super spreader places. And so then the right thing to do to protect people is, is, is to shut the schools. I do think that that trade-off as the pandemic wore on got, got made in, in, in the wrong place. And understanding that it is in, incredibly difficult, for, particularly for teachers with, with pre-existing conditions. Uh, but I think part of it is that, and there's a sort of indulgence or privilege in the way that we all pretended we were at risk from, from COVID when we really weren't all at risk, not in the same ways. So the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions, I don't, so much more likely to get severe COVID or to die than anybody who was, who was young and healthy. And this is, I am the product of a doctor's daughter, which means that I was often shoved out the door after breaking an arm and told to go fend for myself. So I have a little bit of, I have a little bit of like, kind, kind of don't, don't exaggerate the risk to yourself. Yourself. And 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 I think we were all we were I think we were all a little bit in, indulgent about uh, about that, or at least a, a lot of us were allowed to be a little bit indulgent about that in, in lockdowns as well as in school closures. But it, but it's it wasn't an easy answer. That said, the United States is the only place that didn't get schools reopened, so you have to say that something went wrong here. And the data became pretty clear pretty quickly that schools were not super spreader zones, and that the spread in schools was actually less than 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 in, than in the community. Um, at large, and on, if you really, really still on top of that said, teachers are, are, are terrified, okay, can't our government get it together or couldn't the private sector get it together to get N95s to every teacher in every every classroom who had to be with, with students? Couldn't we have gotten it together to get plastic divides it's separating the teacher from the students so the teachers could still, could still have taught? Couldn't someone have come up with a plan not to leave the least privileged people in our society, meaning kids, uh, underprivileged kids, without access to learning for, 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 two, for two years? I mean, when you look at the statistics, it's terrible. And at LA United, at the New York Public Schools, at CPS, Chicago Public Schools, 30 to 40 percent of kids gone, gone from the system, and that's I I, I think that's that's a tragedy and something that we will be paying for in this country for for decades to come. Yeah, can so, I respond real quick? Yeah. I think that's all. I think I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. I think actually tying that back to what the gentleman in the front said, I think so much of it is a professionalism aspect of when you have the opportunity cost of everybody else yeah. working virtually and then you being asked to be a frontline worker for $70,000 a year, yes. right? And yes. it, it feels like a, an unfair professional ask. Yes. Um, I think all of the consequences make a lot of sense, but this this piece of like the professionalism aspect of the, of the yeah. teaching profession. Yeah. You're, you're right, and that, it's a really good point, and I think that's really true because I think what, what happened in COVID was a lot of teachers feeling angry for years, and then this being the tipping point about being asked to be unsafe. And the same thing happened to nurses, feeling angry for years as they were increasingly, just like the global supply chain, increasingly stretched and increasingly asked to absorb all sorts of indignities from low pay to just-in-time staffing. And so then the pandemic hits, and they're forced to work in really unsafe conditions for really long hours and a lot of them snapped and that's why our healthcare workforce is breaking today um, and really breaking I mean the, the 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 shortage of nursing the shortage of nurses and even doctors leaving the profession is 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 pretty astounding and it's all the same thing it's people being asked to do way too much even in the run-up to the pandemic for too little money relative to what they saw others making I think we've got time for two more right could we go for online I really appreciate whenever I listen to you you have a stance on things and it's like backed by supporting evidence and an issue as thorny and complex as COVID and just kind of in your professional career, how do you go about building those stances and thinking through and like determining for yourself, like what is the answer here? So I like to believe, I'll give you the answer I like to believe, and then maybe we can, we can shade it with some truth. But I, I still think I am, I once uh, gave a, a, a speech at my alma mater, Williams, about how math made me a better journalist. And I was a math major. Uh, and, and even though I was not a very good math major, and I persevered through my math major by, by just 
sheer perseverance, not because I was very good at it at the end of the day. But doing proofs just gives you, it, it just trains your brain in a certain way. And if you think in terms of proofs, I think you're just so much less likely to fall victim to pre-existing biases because either, even if you have a pre-existing bias, either the information comes in that the proof can line up or it, or it, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you can't kid yourself that this, that this still makes sense or this story is so good that you can ignore the failure of internal logic. So I think, I, I think, I think there's that. Um, and I hope that that compensates for any pre-existing biases that I, that I, that I may bring to things. I, I don't know. I'm not ideological by, by nature. I tend to take each issue as, as it is. And I, I hope I'm not complimenting myself too much by saying that. But I, I don't think I have much pre-existing ideology. And sometimes I've actually had, I've wrestled with myself about that and thought, would it be better if I had a worldview through which I saw things so that then I could very clearly have an instantaneous reaction to things that happen because it would, I'd have a worldview. And I, I don't. And so I tend to look at each thing and try to decide what I, what I, what, what I think about it. And I'm, that's, it's definitely more inefficient. And I'm not sure that it always gets me to the right answer. But I do take each thing um, um, on its face, I, 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 I think. Um, so I think, I think that's, I think that's that's part of it as well. And then I was also trained as a as a magazine journalist. And so if you're a magazine journalist, you're supposed to have a point of view. You're not supposed to go into something with a point of view, but you are supposed to come out of it with a point of view. And it's at least in old school magazine journalism, it was viewed as lazy to not be able to come to not be able to make up your mind what you thought about something. It was viewed as lazy and kind of weak to then say, oh, here are the facts. You you decide for yourself. Um, so I'm used to by that training, kind of having to having to come to a point of view. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you. Um, I found it interesting earlier when you said about PE firms, you can go and fix it without the demands of public pressure. And a lot of the work that I did before in nonprofit fed consulting was pretty much like COVID response. And in a lot of cases, education, distribution, access, et cetera, the right answer was mirrored by how the public would respond to what we foresaw as the right answer. Yeah. So I guess my take is, as, as we're going to be leaders in 20 years, 30 years, how should we reconcile or tr what learnings or advice would you have for instances where the public demand may be different than what we believe is actually the right answer, but we need to respond or at least take into account the public perception? Yeah, so let me clarify first of all about private equity. I think that's the way old school private equity worked. I think it doesn't anymore, and that wasn't really your question. But I think now private equity firms are every bit as aggressive as the public market, if not more so, about making profits on a very on a very quick schedule. And any company that's been owned by a private equity firm will start laughing if they tell you that, oh, they get time outside of the harsh eye of needing to make quarterly profits. <laughs> just, no, no, that's not the way it works anymore. I think it's a really tricky thing, and so, um, um, both 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 what what you asked and 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 I guess maybe the larger the, the the larger version of that, which is if you need to get the public to do something, is it is it okay to tell not quite the whole truth because that's you've got a better chance of getting the public the public to do something, and I I can see the the, the merits to that, but I think back to Martin Gurry's argument, the problem with that is that people can find out and they they know and they can get their hands on the source information that you're using too, and if you're not telling people the truth, and they figure out that you're not telling them the truth, then you've, done, you've lost all your credibility. And you've done far more damage than you would have by just being, being honest from the get-go. So I think the world has to work. I, I think that is one of the challenges for leaders today. I think that old school way of um, framing things or trying to oversimplify so that you could get people to do what you wanted them to do, I think it's gone. I think you have to you have to trust people to be able to absorb nuance. And I know when we when we look at our population when we look at our population writ large, you think, oh, that's a, pre that's a recipe for disaster. People aren't capable of absorbing nuance. But actually, if you talk to people one on one, they are. Everybody is. And so I, I think it just has to be a switch in, in, in how things are done. I mean, you didn't, you didn't quite ask this, but to take this from, from there, too. So there's, 
in, in the US right now, we are pushing the boosters very, very hard for everybody over six months old. We're the only country in the world to be doing that. Other countries have a much different um, approach to, to boosters. And the fact that people are being told boosters do something that they don't do is leading to vaccine skepticism. And the public health establishment, people have told me, but we need to do this because this will get more people to take the boosters. But it, but it doesn't, because if people can see for themselves that what you're telling them isn't quite true, you just create distrust. And so I think, I think from what I saw in the pandemic is that broadly speaking, being open to doubt, being open to saying, we think this does this, and, but, but we're not sure, is a way better strategy. Or to go back to the, to the vaccines originally, if they had been marketed with what people knew, which was they're going to prevent you from, from death or hospitalization. We don't really know anything more than that. Would like to believe they're going to stop transmission. Would like to believe you're not going to get COVID if you take a vaccine, but we don't, we don't, we don't know that for, for sure. Then when that massive outbreak happened in Provincetown, the government public health could have said, great, look, the vaccines did what they were supposed to do. They prevented um, the severe outcomes. This is perfect. And instead, it became failure of the vaccines because people who had gotten vaccinated got COVID, turned out people who had gotten vaccinated did transmit, and then people say, we've been lied to. These vaccines don't work. No, they work. They work beautifully. You just oversold them. And so I think, I think we have to live in a world where honesty is the is honesty and acknowledgement of uncertainty is the best strategy. Last audience question, fittingly, from Chicago, and then I'll wrap it up. I wish I was from Chicago. Um, uh, thank you so much. I, I I feel reassured knowing that there are investigative reporters working in, in essentially what I, what I view as public accountability. Um, there's a, a book of essays called The Future of Wealth from a partnership between the Aspen Institute and the, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. It's about economic inclusion, economic mobility. Um, and in that book, they talk about a dilemma, which is that the development of new types of securities, so, so securitization precedes the development of regulation. Yeah. And so there's this inevitable problem. One good example is credit default swaps in 2008. Another is the role that PE plays in privatizing different aspects of the healthcare system, other care, drug addiction recovery, et cetera. So if there's this inevitable problem where um, for-profit entities are securitizing um, aspects of what, what are are part of the public interest, so like healthcare is a great example. Yeah. Um, really appreciate the position of the reporter, but who's responsible for addressing this, some of the key drivers of socioeconomic inequality? So I think I think it is inevitable that private business will always be one step ahead of, of 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 regulators, and so I think it's why ground rules are so important. About and then if you set the right ground rules, then you don't have to be involved in the micro details of how this thing works. So for instance, if we could get executive compensation right, such that people could not make money if their businesses failed and they put millions of people out of work, and their their compensation was tied to the long term success of their business, a lot of these, a lot of the issues would 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 go away. Um, 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 so I think I think that uh, that ability to get the ground rules right will would 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 get rid of some of those some of those issues. The uh, the other question that you asked about about income inequality, I think it has to come back to the structure of of, of wages. And Luigi and I did a podcast with a guy at. Um, Oh my God, this is embarrassing. I'm blanking on his name. I'll remember if anybody's curious, but he's a very um, high profile economist who has talked a lot about the importance of work and the value of work and the dignity of work. And his argument is if you can get wages structured right on the front end, then you prevent so many of these issues on, 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 on the back end. And wages have become part of this, this, this never ending drive for, for, for efficiency that may result in higher profits for corporations, but if that results, if, if that results and people having to pay more in taxes in order to support the people who are working at those, those corporations because they can't make enough money from their jobs. That's just this crazy circle that drains self-respect from, 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 from everybody. So I think, if you, I think if you could get 
if you, and I don't, <laughs> one of the great things about being a journalist is I get to talk about all the problems in the world and diagnose them and have no idea how to fix them. So that's up to you guys in this room to figure out how to fix them. But if you could structure, I think structuring labor markets correctly and as AI comes and, and decimates the current, our, our existing workforce or at least how that workforce functions, it's all the more important. And if you can structure that properly, you address a lot of these, these ills. You, you mentioned that you don't give us solutions. That does an incredible disservice to you and what, what you and Joe have written. Everyone, I encourage you to, to read the book. You talk about uh, community hospitals for private equity. There are lessons learned to be cleaned there and how we contract and, and frankly, in how we live and how we distill information. Thank you so much for joining us today. I promised I'd give you the last words, so my question is broad. What's next? Um, I don't know. Um, that I often think that learning to navigate uncertainty is the key, uh, the key thing you can do in life. And I've come up with a saying for myself, which is that uncertainty is possibility. If you don't know what's going to happen, then the world is open to you. If you know what's going to happen and you have certainty, then that's boring, and you, and you don't know what's and you don't, and 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 you've got it, you've got it all mapped out. So anyway, for all of you in this room, I think to um, embrace uncertainty. But I'm going to keep doing the podcast with Luigi, which I love. I've become obsessed with this question of where capitalism is working as we want it to work and where it isn't working how we want it to work and what we can what what needs to be done to, to, to make it work better and I think that's a defining question for, for our times because in the end our economic system is obviously our society and if you don't have an economic system that functions for most people then you don't have a functioning society so that's where I want to spend my time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in thanking Bethany.